Thanks very much. And uh, it's just great to finally get up here to ISB. I've worked with Lee for at least two decades, uh, very closely on a lot of projects and committees. And uh, he's been a great inspiration to me. In fact, um, most of what I'm doing comes <clears throat> because of having been with him. Now we're going to see some ugly pictures here. This was a, this is an example you talk about how you expose things. So this is exposure to 20 years in the Midwest, <clears throat> and um, so I moved in 2000 to La Jolla. Discovered that I'd become pre-diabetic on the diet that was uh, fed me there, um, and then over uh, the next 10 years, just by learning about and altering nutrition and exercise. Uh, made significant changes, and I actually usually talk about that process. Uh, I won't particularly, MIT um, just did a profile on me as the patient of the future. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is actually in the Cal IT2 labs. We actually have exercise physiology labs and, and so forth. But where we're going is deep inside. <laughs> Uh, and that's actually me. So um, what we're going to do is skip over uh, modifying your body and uh, go into the uh, tracking internally. So um, I'll use one internal marker. This is why I got started in taking blood tests. In the nutrition, I moved, of course, to uh, very much lower omega-6s and much higher doses of omega-3s but I wanted to measure in my blood if that had been effective. And doctors, of course, don't get this and they wouldn't do it. I wanted to measure the AA over EPA, the mega-6 or mega-3 ratio. And, and so I went online and found out you can just get the blood test. Um, and so that's where most, that's type 2 diabetes folks, that's most of Americans, which you can see how close we are, uh, ideal, and then me. Uh, and so I felt pretty good about that because this was all about how to reduce inflammation in your body. And so I figured I must have dead zero inflammation. Um, and I take six fish oil pills a day to just help the omega-3s. But since I was taking blood, I realized there were all these other great things you could do. And of course, occasionally doctors will find the right insurance codes and you can actually get some blood tests through your doctor. Uh, so I included those and I started just keeping uh, samples and, and I was working with yourfuturehealth.com and they encouraged me to do it quarterly and I thought, okay, I, that's cool, that'll generate some data. Uh, so I, I have about a hundred things that I measure uh, about quarterly in my blood and the amazing thing is almost all but one, so 99 of them stayed within normal range. And only one of them, complex reactive protein, which is the generic measure of inflammation in your blood, was significantly outside of range, and in particular, five times uh, higher than the upper limit. So <clears throat> it should be less than one in these units uh, to compare it later with stool inflammation markers. I multiply by 10. Uh, but the, the good range is down here. That's me up there, my first range. And the first thing the doctor said is, uh, when I mentioned this, he said, well, you got 99 right. I mean, come on, how hard can this be? Uh, you know, go home. Um, and then I came back, and, and I, this is over notice. This is years, so this is like a couple years go by. And now I double and then I triple in my uh, CRP. And I go into the doctor and I say, something terrible is going on inside of me. Okay? And they said, well, how do you feel? I said, what the hell kind of question is that? <laughs> You know, I have data. <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, what good is that? I'm a doctor. And he said, come back when you have a symptom. Why are you bothering me? And I was at a conference like this, and I ended up um, over the weekend, and I, and I ended up with the worst pain right down about here that I'd ever had in my life, and it just was very persistent. I was doubled over, I couldn't stand up. So I finally dragged myself back into the hospital, I went to the doctor, I said, you're gonna be so happy. <laughs> I've got a symptom. And um, so they did the classic medical test, they pushed in like this, and said, does that hurt? And when I screamed, they said, good. Now, now does it hurt more when I pull it out like that? And I said, I don't know, yeah. And, and so they said, oh, well you have acute diverticulitis. Um, by that time, I was 15 times normal. So they said, oh, we know how to do this. We'll just give you 10 days of antibiotics. They did so, and, and um, you know, they weren't plotting it, of course, but uh, it did fall back down, and they had see, medicine works, we're all good, 
And I said, but it's still five. <laughs> and they said, what do you want? I mean, you're, you're much better, go home. So the question was, why did I have this? It was just a puzzle. So then I started, I, I realized from the same site, I could get stool tests. Now to this day, I still haven't got doctors asking me to do this, but you know, I guess they got their ways of doing things. Anyway, lactoferrin is a, is, a, is a glycoprotein that's produced by the neutrophils, which when they're attacking stuff in your, in, your, um, in, in your gut, and it's supposed to be in that range. Well, the first one I took was up there, and it's peaking now, and these again years, um, at 25, 30 times normal. So not only I have blood inflammation, I now have inflammation in my, in my colon, um, and of course, nobody cares. So I had a colonoscopy. People say, oh, we'll get a colonoscopy. Well, I, you know, I was doing the other five-year colonoscopy thing. I went back and actually got my medical record, and I had mild inflammation. So then, essentially four years, four and a half years later, and I, I'm very good at getting colonoscopies tuned to the peak of my inflammation, except that I don't know it's the peak until weeks later. So it's some sort of really intuitive thing I've developed. Anyway. <laughs> At that point, after the fact, I had significant inflammation, right? And so as I was going under the anesthesia, I said to the doctor, I said, now that's digital video coming out the back of that black tube, right, that you've stuck up me, Can, and you're looking on the screen. Can you just record that on your disc? And I said, what? <laughs> Go under. You know? I said, I said will you, if you see something cool, will you at least take a picture for me? And I said, okay. So they did, and um, what they found is only in the sigmoid, that's this part you know, here and then back of the colon, large colon, were these inflamed pseudopods, uh, which uh, you know, were indicating that there was inflammation, which of course we knew, but it was at least localized to the sigmoid colon. Now this previous graph that I showed you there only went up to 200, okay? So here is now, uh, putting a little further in time, and you see that my lactoferrin jumps up to 900. Uh, and I again the time to colonoscopy exactly at that point. Uh, and that, if you look up in the literature, is a typical value for lactoferrin, which is the protein along with calprotectin that differentiates whether you have IBD versus IBS, in other words, inflammatory bowel disease versus normal colitis. And so that was the first, so I, and of course I had to figure this out because I'm taking the stool samples, right? The colonoscopist said, oh, you don't have IBD. I knew, I would know it, I would have seen it. I've been doing this 30 years, I know what colons look like, you know, forget it. I said, you don't read the literature much, huh? And I said, you know, it's clear that if you've got a 900 lactoferrin, you have IBD. Um, and so I got a new doctor. Uh, and you can see that in blue, the CRP is also, but they're not exactly in phase, and that's one of the things. So then they did biopsies. I had to get them to do the biopsies. Anyway, they did the biopsies and uh, together really decided that I had, although very late onset. Now, this is the CRP over time. And notice that first thing, which seems so like a big deal, was has been dwarfed in that peak up there, 27. Now, to put this in perspective, if you have a CRP chronically greater than four, you quintuple your future chance of heart disease because CRP and LDL are co-creating the plaque that goes in your arteries. So, um, but actually, this is where I was before. Remember, that's where we had the antibiotics. And because I take these frequently enough in time, I can see that that collapse down was before I took the antibiotics. <coughs> Now the doctor, of course, claimed the whole thing, but I actually went back and looked carefully at the data. And over here, when I'm 27X, here I just finished a month of antibiotics uh, because of the IBD, but all that fall was spontaneous. So the, this just gives you an idea, when they talk about it being episodic, just if you get fine enough times, you can begin to see how much your body is naturally handling and correcting itself before they do the antibiotics. And of course, the antibiotics have long-term damage, as we just heard about. And I'll show you my own uh, version of that. OK, so but to really get the smoking gun, um, the difference, so you got IBD, and it's ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Now, the difference is ulcerative colitis is essentially on the surface of the colon. It's, as, as my doctor, uh, William Sanborn, is one of the leading clinical researchers in IBD, says it's like you take sandpaper to the inside of your large intestine. 
But Crohn's actually attacks the walls of your colon, and therefore it's a lot um, tougher. Uh, so this is, so I got an MRI with enterography. That means you drink a lot of barium and get it injected. Uh, and I had a CT before that. Uh, and so there's my liver, there's my transverse colon across the top, there's a small intestine, and then this part right here is the sigmoid colon. And this is the image that they were looking at, right? So I said, don't do a lot of virtuality, do you? Would you give me the um, DICOMs of the format of all the slices that you had? Then I put it in our um, Cal IT2 uh, 3D visualization that you fly through it um, and then you can go in and actually trace, uh, actually fly around your colon, go in and look closely at it, see all the kinks. The kinks that are in your colon, it's amazing. <laughs> I don't see how anything gets through there. Um, and so here now I've zoomed in on my uh, disease colon and when you look at it you can go in from the front, from the back, uh, these are diverticula. See this guy up here? Um, and so I knew I had diverticula. 50% of people in their 60s have it. But, you know, see, they say, well, it's a little outpotching, right? And you think of your colon as this nice, smooth little thing, little tube. Well, that's what it looks like. Um, and then you get the mesenteric arteries, which you're seeing there as well. They're swollen, um, as you can see. Uh, and this is the report from the, the expert uh, MRI person who I got back into and spent a half an hour with going through the 2D stuff. Um, so there's engorgement of the, of the mesenteric arteries and so forth. So now what I've spent many, many hours doing is, uh, and you need an NVIDIA card in your PC to really do this well, um, th this is the colon, and then I just go in and I can, in with my program, I can slice through it at an arbitrary angle. And so there is the cross-section of your, um, uh, in yellow, and you know, the skin of your colon is like what they make sausages out of, is like, the, like a balloon, it's like three millimeters. Well here it's 12 to 15 millimeters, okay? And that's because of the Crohn's actually beginning to act, and more importantly, you can see the little darker areas, those are the sinuses that are opening up in that enlarged wall, and then the bad bacteria can get in there, and that's where they can really do a lot of bad things. But it's only about 16 centimeters, so this whole thing is um, localized at that point. So, I, I mean, it's, there's something existentially good about staring the villain inside you, you know, in the face, I mean, really, I don't know what it does my, medically, but it does a lot for your head. And, and I, so I spent a lot of time inside my colon. <laughs> because we can go into this virtual reality cave, and you can actually put your head, I mean, it's uh, kind of... Um, <laughs> let, let me just say, I know a lot more about my colon than my doctor does. Um, now, the, the, so I got very interested in autoimmune diseases, which IBD is just one of, and it turns out that 10% of Americans have an autoimmune disease, there are 80 of them that the NIH recognizes. Um, and David Relman is such an honor to be uh, on the same stage as him. He's been one of the people, you know, was sort of, there was his paper uh, with Eckberg and others in, in 2005, and there was sort of, that was sort of time started in that point forward because of the first phylogenetic detailed phylogenetic uh, structure of the gut bacteria. So that's had a huge influence on my thinking. But this is from a later paper he did uh, on Crohn's and microbes, uh, and saying that, as everybody does, the pathogenesis of this disease is an unknown complex interaction between genetic predisposition and environmental, that is, uh, microbes. So I said, okay, well, if it's genetic predisposition, fortunately I was one of the first people to put my spit into 23andMe, so I went back and I, and I put in Crohn's in the search, <laughs> and up comes the GWAS that these are all sites of your million SNPs that have been associated from uh, genome-wide association studies, and NOD2, which is the one that is mostly, that was the original one known about, I don't have. So if it's green, it means you're less likely, or if it's red, that's uh, more likely. Uh, what mine has, it's 80% more likely, is a, is a SNP in the uh, interleukin-23 receptor gene. That's interleukin-23 is, is one of the pro-inflammatory interleukins. 
And if you then get into the literature and, and read uh, a lot about it, it turns out that it's a master regulator in Crohn's. And so that was like clue, okay? I had a predisposition to pro-inflammatory. And without getting into the details, this is from one of the papers on this interleukin-23 um, and uh, TLPR17 uh, pathway. So, so what happens is normally you have this dynamic balance between pro and anti-inflammation and the number of Tregs and, and TLPR cells and so forth that you're making. But then if you have this excess of production of pro-inflammatory, you get out of balance like this. So that's on your human side. However, we know that if you have various diseases, that you have a major change in the ecological structure uh, of the um, uh, bacteria. We've heard a number of things, but you can see in just inflammatory bowel disease how big a change there is at the phyla level. Um, well, so, you know, in the real world of commercial stool testing, um, they haven't really gotten to next generation gene sequencing, and they certainly didn't back in, you know, 2005. So you can go back and culture, and that's what most of them commercially do. So these are just the cultured bacteria. But, and what I've done is just stack them up. You know, they're supposed to, they're zero, one plus, two plus, three plus, or four plus, depending on how it works out on the petri dishes. Um, and here are these major four groups uh, of uh, good bacteria. If they were all four plus, that'd be that black line across the top. And what you can see is here's the 10 days of antibiotics, and over the next year, all but the E. coli go to zero. And then it takes like three years for them to build back up, and then they collapse again. And so I don't know, I would love to know, I'd love to be able to do what Eric is doing every day of taking his stool. I, I sort of like taking stool samples. Um, but at the same time, these are all the bad guys of which we heard in the hospital uh, earlier. Uh, a number of them are there. Uh, hopefully they're not uh, antibody resistant, although every time I take antibiotics, Darwin works, and what's left behind is more resistant than the ones that were there before. Uh, but you can see that there's a, a none of these should be there uh, at normally uh, when you when you do uh, stool samples. So there's clearly a major dysbiosis going on. But if you can actually now go in and sequence them also, most of your bacteria aren't culturable. Uh, and this is a paper that um, was done back in 2006. Then you see again, as we know, most of them are bacteria deeds are firmicutes. But if you're in IBD, what you find is that two thirds of the firmicute species have disappeared. So the body's done away with them. And one reason is because they are inhibitors of pro-inflammation. And so if they're removed and you've got a pro-inflammation SNP, then you've got an open loop for pro-inflammation and nothing to push back on it. So one of the things I've learned is the microbes are friends for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that they actually are the spring that sort of pushes back on a lot of the human failings, in this case, uh, inflammation because of a SNP. Now, furthermore, and I don't know for sure, uh, Eric is saying he's not sure how much you should believe this, but this was the first gene catalog uh, of the gut microbiome that was published in 2010. And the amazing thing is that just using principal component analysis as we just saw, <clears throat> you can not only differentiate healthy from uh, IBD, but even more so you can differentiate um, uh, ulcerative colitis from Crohn's. And you'll notice that Crohn's is much further away, that the healthy and the and UC are closer, because they're actually not that different from a you know um, phenomenology point of view compared to Crohn's. Now there's no human biomarker that I'm aware of that will tell the difference between UC and Crohn's. And yet if you just ask the microbes by looking at their diversity, you can find out that. So there's, there's a whole bunch of diagnostics coming that are based on just the microbe diversity and not the human piece. The amazing thing to me is that 25% of the genes in your microbes, and they have 100 times as many genes as your human, are gone in IBD. This is not a small effect. Right? Now, whether those 25% of the genes are in the two-thirds of the firmicutes that are gone, which are clostridiums, I don't know. Although I do, I can do the culturable clostridia species, and mine are very low, and, I, and they make butyrate on top of inhibiting pro-inflammation, the major source of energy for your um, 
epithelial tissues in your colon, and my butyrate I can measure as a short chain fatty acid in my stool samples, and I am very low on butyrate, I'm very low on clostridia, so it seems likely that um, I'm in that boat. But to find out, I said, well, why should I be the only person in the world that can't have their own metagenomics done the way all you guys do? And so, fortunately, Craig Venter uh, and I have worked together on various projects like Camera that was uh, mentioned, Victoria mentioned earlier. Um, and so, uh, Karen Nelson, who did the first metagenomic um, uh, catalog of the of healthy gut, gut microbes in Manny, um, uh, Taralba uh, agreed to uh, do my gut microbiome. I sent him a stool sample uh, January 1st, and I just got back um, a hard disk drive with 35 gigabytes of short reads. Uh, we've cleaned them uh, because we have a pi pipeline in the Moore Foundation camera things. 230 million reads after filtering and after removing the, the human uh, only 0.2%, by the way, were, were human. Uh, so it was a very clean and very thorough sample. Now we only are going to need to use about somewhere between 10 and 100,000 CPU hours to do the assembling, annotation, and so forth in the pipeline. And, and we fortunately got it at the supercomputer center. But um, it's impressive to me how much more computing there is than in cost than, than the genome sequencing. Now one last topic I want to point out is I think it's very likely that when we go from hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, of determining disease nouns, like Crohn's disease, by symptoms, okay, to system definition, the way Lee has been talking about. In other words, physically, what's wrong with you? So if you know how the gene has been SNP changed, and you know what the um, other aspects of proteomics, metabolomics, then you can physically talk about different disease states. So for instance, I have a female, uh, somewhat distant relative uh, that has had Crohn's since she was 20, and she's got the standard nod uh, SNP. She doesn't have the interleukin-23. Uh, these are in different parts of the immune system and so forth. Uh, if you actually look at the meta-study, NOD2 is associated with ileal, ileal uh, uh, Crohn's instead of colonic. So in other words, the Crohn's that's based over here, where your small intestine joins your large intestine, these are, this is much more devastating uh, than having late onset colonic Crohn's. And you can tell the difference just from the SNPs, evidently. But even more amazing is that you can, this is what Janet Jansen's work at LBL, you can do the metabolomics, so your metabolic products of the gut back microbes clearly separates the, the disease type of whether it's ileal based or clonic based. And in a later paper that she was involved in, if you do the uh, analysis of just the microbes, once again, you see the blue, which are healthy, and the green, which are ulcerative colitis, are almost on top of each other. But the two distinct types of Crohn's, which seem, which they're not normally talked about as separate diseases, I think they are by this approach, uh, are again quite separable. And so, it, and of course, why shouldn't they be if the metabolic products of the microbes are different? It's probably because the microbes are different. Uh, and, and so there it is. Well, where are we going? And this is the last, next to last slide. Well, I was feeling pretty good about this, right? And, and you know, here I am phenotyping myself uh, out the wazoo and, 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 and so forth. And then Mike Snyder comes along, who's head of genetics at Stanford, and last month in Cell says that, oh, by the way, for the last two years, I've done just what you've done, except a thousand times as many data points. <laughs> And so, you know, he did not only this, he didn't do just the SNPs, that's a million, he did all six billion diploid at 140x, which is probably the, the most accurate human genome ever done. Uh, then the transcriptome of that, which I haven't even started, the full proteome, the full uh, metabolome, the full uh, auto uh, antibodyome. Uh, and, and then did all of those, other than the gen, of his genome, on 
a monthly basis, just like I did. So he has the full genome as the context, and then the biomarkers every month. Um, but again, the numbers are in the tens of thousands. Uh, and he watched his diseases develop as a result. But guess what he didn't do? The microbiome. So here's the head of genetics at Stanford, and this is a once in a decade paper. I mean, I, I was bowled over when I saw this paper. But he's looking at 1% of the genes. All the rest are in the microbes. So where I think we're going is to really understand these autoimmune diseases. You've got to couple the human immune system and how it's genetically determined with, and I use uh, in deference to David being here, uh, the picture from his article that showed the phylogenetic breakout of the gut microbes. And then you've got to do the molecular interactions of the proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics of the joint genetic expression between the human, the host, and the uh, gut microbes. Because that's how we work. And almost all the other talks you've heard today are showing you examples of how we co-create either health or disease between the host and the microbiome. Thanks.